Good morning and happy Sabbath. For those of you who are visiting us from home and here for the first time, I want to welcome you to the movement. If you see our motto, it's a place of worship that brings healing. A place of worship that brings healing. I also want to welcome you to this Holy Spirit series entitled Led by the Spirit. This morning, I have a lot to cover, and I'm going to start with my wake-up call this morning. 3.39 a.m. Get up. We got work to do. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a study that we did in my master's program at Washington Adventist University. And I'm going to start with a word that it was actually given to us in our hermeneutics class. And here's the word. Got it? Syncretism. Say it with me. Come on, say it again. And this is the key word for today's message. Syncretism means the mixing of religious beliefs and practices. And it was a word created, listen, it was a word created when Christians began to bring heathen practices into Christianity. And it made them syncretist, sin like synthesis to bring together beliefs, practices, and rituals. Syncretism. Syncretism. My subject this morning is living in deception. Living in deception. Let's pray. Father, I know you have me. Just hide me behind your cross one more time. In Jesus' name, amen. We talked about the Holy Spirit and what he does, who he is, what he does. Now we're talking about how do we receive the Holy Spirit. In a couple of weeks, we're going to study 1 Corinthians chapter 12, dealing with the gifts of the Spirit. You see, receiving the Spirit will also bring some gifts with it. And we're going to learn soon that if a gift is given, listen, if a gift is given and not used, the gift becomes a curse to the receiver. And we're going to discuss how, you know, we, 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 we have been discussing, you know, the, the receiving the Spirit. And, and, and I found it necessary to talk about false manifestations of the Spirit. And I want to make sure that you can, you can tell the real from the false. There are people who think that they're having a spiritual experience, and they are, but the Spirit is not of God. There are non-godly spiritual experiences. You know, we read in verse um, in Revelation 16 that they, 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 are, they are spirits of demons performing miracles. So everything that is spiritual is not necessarily godly. And you need to dwell on that. Everything that is spiritual is not necessarily godly. So we began to deal with these false manifestations of the Spirit by looking at the contents of Acts chapter 19 about this. We began dwelling also in the study with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In Acts chapter 19, we studied the sons of Sceva, church members, church members, okay, who sought to have spiritual power without full commitment to the source of the Spirit and the source of that power. And I'm not sure yet that you actually understand how vulnerable that makes a person. A person looking for godly powers without commitment to God. And it opens that person to powers that are not of God. You follow that? So this thing is more serious than just a funny story in the Bible. You know, we went further to say that the problem with the sons of Sceva is that 
they, they wanted to experience spiritual power in a sensational, dynamic way. And we have said that God does often actually manifest himself in a very sensational and dynamic way, but it, 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 that, that is not necessarily a pure measurement of the Spirit's presence. Because the devil can duplicate dynamism. So we read this statement, and I don't apologize for reading it again. Why? Because repetition builds impression. And it was found in the book that we've been using, The Coming of the Comforter, page 155, and you're reading with me. Listen to what it says. Many, read, many are looking for what? Joyous thrills and marvelous spiritual shocks. And we need to pause there because if you haven't noticed this by reading this statement, this is the nature of our present society. Have you noticed how quickly Americans get bored? And even the most dra dramatic of stories, haven't you noticed that it lasts for a week? And, and, and that's a long time. Usually it lasts for a couple of days and something else happens. Right? In fact, most of us, if they, get, if they carry the news story for three or four days, we're going to be asking, you know, are they going to keep playing that? We've been conditioned for a constant barrage of shocks and stimulations. Come on, folks. Wake up. All right, let's keep reading. Wish. If they do not have, they are disheartened. Really, the filling of the Spirit was not meant to be extraordinary. And some of us are still not convinced. We still think that when, when we receive the Spirit, there is going to be some kind of, um, you know, shock or something, you know, going on in our, you know, we just, we just feel that it must be that way. And what some of us do not understand is that often in the quiet moment, just you seeking the Lord for strength, the Spirit falls on you. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Friends, you can have a deep spiritual experience all by yourself. Let's continue. It is a heritage provided as the normal experience for Christians. Daily, how often? Daily. Daily enabling us to do what? To live a what? Holy life and to what? To serve effectually as well as to meet crisis by special endowments. There need, there need to be no ecstatic joy. And then he tells you what it means. Barnabas never had the experience of Paul. Yet both of them were filled with the Spirit. So filling, filling is not based on what? Feelings. feelings, but on what? So last week, we studied about the deceptions of Satan. That Satan, what, who, who is a student of prophecy, notice Joel chapter 2. And in Joel chapter 2, in verse 28 through 32, Joel predicted outstanding manifestations of spiritual power in the last days. But Joel actually said, when you see those signs, start looking for spiritual power to be manifested. So all of us have been born and live in, in, in the era, thank you Jesus, when great spiritual powers will come. So, so, so we ought to be expecting power. But it needs to be the real power. We ought to be expecting it. But unfortunately, well, maybe fortunately, Satan studied prophecy and he has sought to bring false manifestations of spiritual power. Now, 2 Thessalonians um, chapter 2. Go there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Again, we're just going to study today. 2 Thessalonians chapter If you find one T in the Bible, you found them all. 
They're all together. All the T's in the Bible are together. 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul begins to define the nature of this false power. 2 Thessalonians 2, and we're going to read from verse 1. Ready? You there? Just one person is there. You there? All right, read. Here we go. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. So he is discussing the coming of who? The coming of who? Come on, folks, talk to me. The coming of who? Jesus. So this is a second coming text. Are you with me? Then he says, that you be not shaken. Stop. I need you to think about this. You see, there's going to be the false power. There's going to be a false power, and some of them will be so strong that it will do what? Shake. Don't be afraid to say that word. Shake. People in the church will be shaken out of the church by false manifestation. Huh? Yeah, of God. Particularly if they are inclined to be those who feast on sensationalism. Those who feast on feelings. Those who feel, you know, feast on dynamism. They feast on the, on the eccentric. Now, verse 3 talks about a man, you know, about the man of sin being revealed. And it describes him. But jump to verse 7. <laughs> Go to verse 7. Read this. It said this. For the mystery of iniquity, that means these false manifestations, doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until be taken out of the way. Verse 8. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Somebody ought to say amen. That means that falseness will not prevail. I guess I'm going to enjoy this all by myself. The false will not prevail. The devil will not have eternal success. It's like the Negro spiritual says, trouble will not last always. Now, you know, you get to be quiet there. I just want to enjoy this. The Lord woke me up early. Hmm? Yes. And then he says in verse 9, um, even him who's coming is after the working of who? Satan. Satan. With all powers and signs and lying wonders. Now verse 10 is going to define the nature of the lying wonders. You know, meaning verse 10 is key. Keep reading. It says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that what? Perish. Perish. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be what? They will be deceitful. Listen, because this text is so rich with information. They will be deceitful righteousness. Satan has his own brand of righteousness. Reason why I put the word syncretism on the screen for you, which is mixing of religions. Syncretism. We're talking about false, a false brand of righteousness. And Jesus preached in Matthew 24, verse 24, we actually read it last week, that he talked about false Christ and false prophets. You see, Satan has his own church. He has false commandments. Does he not? False love called infatuation. He has a false Sabbath. False. The devil is an expert at religion. False religious acts. False religious doctrines. But, but I am comforted and I have great peace because the text ends by saying that the only ones deceived will be those who do not love the truth. So if I am one, all right, that loves the truth, I'm going to be okay. I will not be deceived. 
My great defense against the deception is the word of God. It, you know, and I was talking about it, you know, uh, you, they, they don't even say anything. Did you touch your Bible this week? Mm. Why has he, why he got to go there? Why has he got to go there? And today I want, I, I, I want, to, I, I want to re-implant in your, in your mind the fact that most of the devil's deceptions in the last days will not be deceptions outside in the world. It will be deceptions in the church. Which is why I made the statement that there will be more people lost in the last days over false religion than there will be people lost over no religion at all. And I, I want to keep harking on that. Now I'm done with the introduction. Now I'm getting ready for the sermon for today. Now, so, what? It's Sabbath. When, when, when sundown? Eight? I'm going to take my wash off. All right? Now, one of the... <laughs> don't be scared. I'm going to finish on time. I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish. Don't be, don't be tipping up, you know, don't be tipping toying out of here. One, one of the areas that we have been studying that has confused many people spiritually is the issue of speaking in tongues. Go to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. Thank you, Jesus. 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians is after Romans, is one, two books after the book of Acts. All right. 1 Corinthians 12. I want you to look at verse 7. Ready? Here we go. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to who? Every man, Every man and woman to profit from it. You see, don't tell me I don't have the Spirit. You're lying to yourself. It's how you use it that is going to be manifested. Okay? Yeah. All right, here we go. Verse 7. Uh, well, verse 8. Here we go. Um, for to one is given by the Spirit, number one, the word of what? Yeah. To another, number two, the word of? By the same Spirit. Everybody got that? So we got two already, right? Those are, those are what? Gifts, right? Yeah, yeah. And then here we go, verse 9. To another, faith by the same Spirit. So that's three, right? To another, what? The gift of what? Healing. Healing by the same Spirit. Oh, that makes it four, right? To another, the working of miracles. That's five. To another, prophecy. That's six. To another, discerning of spirits. That's seven. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. That's eight. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. That's nine. But our main passages, you know, to consider today, because I'm about to actually link chapter 12 with chapter 14 in a minute. Our main passage to, to demand our study for today is 1 Corinthians chapter 14. All right? I, I want you to go there, 1 Corinthians 14. But I want to tell you a little bit of background about Corinth. Just in case you did not know, the Corinthian church, or the Corinthian letter, the letter um, known as 1 and 2 Corinthians, was written by Paul to a group of people that he met. And he met them in Acts chapter 18, the Corinthians. Paul spent a year and a half there. He had been to Athens before, total failure. Left Athens, went 40 miles to the west to the city of Corinth. Great success in the work there. It was the worship of the Greek, it, it, it was there that you found the worship of the Greek god Apollo, supposedly the father of the gods. But they also worship the goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of love, beauty, fer fertility, sex. Listen, friends, because there has been a teaching, there has to be a teaching moment in every single sermon. So stay awake. The worship of these two gods, with the little g, was the foundation of religious life in Corinth. 
and it is persistent uh, it, it, it is persistent to the issues you know that raised by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 for us to understand the religious background of the Greeks who have been there prior to Christianity the Greeks worship their gods dynamically do you hear what I say the Greeks worship their gods dynamically there were hymns there were sacrifices even sacrifices of human beings. But now let me share with you some of the things that we found in our class about the Greek culture. Listen, because this is amazing. I'm just laying the, the, the foundation uh, before we get to se, se, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. The ancient Greeks would pray on their feet with their hands raised to the sky while they were praising Zeus and other heavenly gods they also when they wanted to worship Hades the king of the underworld or, or the deities of the underworld they would kneel down to the earth powerfully hitting the earth with their hands in order to be heard loudly down there Another interesting fact that I found in, my, in our research is that they will often roll on the ground in ecstasy as they talk to their God. Syncretism. You see, you, 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 know, you keep wondering why this problem of speaking in tongues arise in, in, in Corinth. Huh? Why were they caught up in this? You have nine gifts. Why did they get caught up in only this one? And, and I need to make this very practical for you to understand what is happening here. When you come to Christ, you have to come all the way. Well, let me say that again. Just one amen is good, but I need more. When you come to Christ, you got to come all the way. Amen. You must cut loose of everything in the past. Uh-oh. Hey, 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 let me tell you, you, you must be honest with yourself, all right? You must be honest enough with yourself to know what hooked you up out there to make sure that you don't bring it with you in here. The worship was dynamic. Raising hands, pounding on the ground, rolling in the dust as they communicated with Zeus and Aphrodite. Are you listening to me? The Greek gods were just really advanced human beings when you think about it. Capricious, equally good and bad, the, 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 the human beings that worship them. They worship, uh, the worship of these gods was loud, festive, emotional, erotic. And last but not least, in Greek worship, women worship on equality with men. Now, when you read the first letter to these Corinthians believers, many of whom were many of whom were Greek of Greek origin, you recognize that they were they were struggling uh, to be real Christians. There were battles with their old ways and concepts, and if you study history, you know that Satan had great success in in in, in diluting Christianity. Satan had great success in diluting Christianity with syncretism. The practice of mixing religions. The practice of bringing one religion into another religion. Friends, some of us come from a background before we came to the church of lots of lots and of sensuality. Why are you sitting there all quiet? Lots of sensuality. And a lot of activity and exciting stuff in the church. I told you before, there's nothing wrong with excitement. But you have to know that when you came in the church, Satan did not turn you loose. He keeps hounding you and hounding you because you spent time with him out there. He knows what buttons to push. Am I talking to somebody here? You better give those buttons up to Jesus every day. 
He will, he will push him. I don't like it. So in the book of 1 Corinthians, in chapter 1 through 11, Paul deals with, with some syncretistic issues such as man worship, admiring worldly wisdom, admiring worldly wisdom, strife over leaders, the need to cleanse the church of immorality and, uh, and litigation and all sensuality, the sanctification of marriage. And in chapter 11, he deals with the right to use, the, the right use of the Lord's Supper. These people were not even doing the Lord's Supper right. They turned the communion into a service feast. Yeah, they, they turned the whole thing into a feast, separating those who have much food to eat from those who did not have much food. In other words, they could not do anything right because they kept trying to pull the past. Help us, Lord. Pull the past into the present. Let me say it if you haven't figured it out yet. Christianity is a new way of life. It's a new walk. It's a new lifestyle. Where all things are passed away, behold, all things are made new. You cannot bring both in. In chapter 12 through 15, Paul gets more doctrinal. In fact, we use 1 Corinthians to actually show us how to deal with church administration and church services. He explained spiritual gifts in chapter 12. The doctrine of love in chapter 13. The, 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 place, the, the, the place of tongues in chapter 14. And the resurrection in chapter 15. The theme of the first book of, 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 the book of 1 Corinthians is cleansing the church from false conceptions of the truth. That's what the book is about. And the background of worship was emotional and sensational. How does Paul address this issue then? Well, it appears, now ladies, don't, don't, don't get offended. It appears that in the Corinthian, in the, in the Corinthian church on Sabbath, People were rising up and speaking in tongues. Most of them were women. Just out of nowhere, you were preaching and they just got up and started speaking in another tongue. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 14, go there now. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verses 34 and 35. These are verses that ladies do not like. Yeah, look at verse 34. It says this. I'm going to explain it to you so you understand why people misunderstand these texts. Verse 34, the beginning, it says, Let your woman keep silence in the churches. He's responding to them standing up. It is as if I was preaching on Sabbath, and some of you started standing up, and I will be saying to you, be quiet. Let me finish. All right? That's what he's saying here. All right? That's why Paul wrote that text. Be silent in the church. Let the woman, all right? That was the main problem. But why? Be silent in the church. And then, it, you know, it says in verse 35, and if they will learn anything, let them have their husband at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Meaning, back then, if you need to get something, Get it from your husband at home. All I'm doing is explaining it. And I know the ladies don't like it. But I have to explain it. Why? Because Paul said it. And we men take this and we what? We, we actually bend it for our own good. That, 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 that's all I'm going to say about this because I have, I'm in enough trouble already. So, Paul sets up chapter 14 what, what he explains, but he explains it, he's explaining what's happening in chapter 12. Let's go to chapter 12. Go backwards. 1 Corinthians 12. Here we go. All right. Now, 
I need you to stay with me because this is the key to understand what Paul is saying about the gift of tongues. In chapter 12, Paul establishes that there are nine gifts from the Spirit, not just one. We read them. And the first point he makes in chapter 12, the Spirit gave them all, not just one. The Spirit is behind faith. The Spirit is behind wisdom. Are you following me? Second, in chapter 12, Paul takes the time to explain that it is ridiculous to compare one gift with another. You know that, 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 that part of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the body and how the eye should not talk about the ear. You see, they're, they're, that, that, that really is the discussion of tongues. He's discussing the gifts. It comes right after the names of the, uh, after he names the gifts, and he says it would be ridiculous for the eye to say, I don't need the hand. He says it is ridiculous to say that because I have tongues, I don't need faith. Because I have tongues, I don't need wisdom. Are you following me now? He's actually saying it is ridiculous for church members to compare their gifts inside the church. The one who sings is not better than the one who prays. I'll say amen for you. Amen. And because we come from a competitive society, in the church, we often tend to lift one gift above the other. So we make more fuss over a good singer than a good prayer. And that's important stuff. This is important stuff Paul, Paul is actually discussing here. So that this thing about the body is not about just about the body. Paul is saying, how dare you compare and make more competitive gifts, which all come from the same spirit. And then at the end of chapter 12, which we'll, we'll spend more time in the coming weeks, Paul sets up chapter 13. Look at this verse of, of, of you know, look at the last verse of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. Listen to what he says in verse uh, in, 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 in 1 Corinthians, the last verse, it says, but, verse 31, but cover earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And this is the setup for chapter 13. In chapter 13, Paul does one thing. He makes it clear that any manifestation of any gift in the church not, is not, not boosted by love. It's a waste of time. He says the main influence of what we do at the movement ought to be love. That's why we set up a church that you come as you are because it's none of my business to change you. You know how people, you know, just hammer at you? Didn't you know that you have to do? Shut up. Let, let the Spirit deal with people. You don't need to compare each other. Just love one another. And that's why he says in that chapter that charity bounteth not itself. It's not puffed up. He's talking about the people who have the gift of tongues. They, that they, they thought that they were better than those who did not actually, who, who, they, you know, who did not have it and only pray. And Paul says, true love does not do that. So you cannot understand chapter 13 until you study chapter 12 in the light of chapter 14. Chapter 13 is not just about charity. It's about the right use of love amongst people who has the gifts from God. And Paul is saying, stop comparing yourself to one another. Are you following me? Now, Paul is ready to address what happens inside that church. One of the things that Paul clears up in chapter 14, and we're going to remain there for the rest of the sermon, Paul makes it clear that the Spirit of God is not involved in this organization and confusion. Right? 
Everybody with me? Go to 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33. Come on. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. Listen to what it says. It says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Don't you love God? He says, if there's confusion and competition and people berating one another, God, I'm not the author of that. If people are comparing themselves among themselves, I'm not the author of that. Everybody cannot sing. I wish everybody knew they could not sing. I try to sing. Don't ask me to sing. Everybody does not have the gift of wisdom. And to be comparing is confusion. Paul says, this is what it says in verse, in verse 40. Listen to what it says. It says, let all things be done, what? Decently and? You see, people always tell me, why you got to be so orderly? Why you got to plan everything? Because the Bible tells me that I got to do it. Oh, that's because you were in the military. No, Paul said it. Don't just stand up and start saying something. Let it be order inside the church. Nobody said amen. Okay, you know, in another text, actually, he tells them, if you're going to speak in tongues, get up one at a time and let somebody interpret. Which means... You must be saying something that somebody can understand. Duh. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, it's gonna be, I'm going to make it very practical. And I'm not making fun of anybody. I just want to point you to the right text in the Bible for you to understand what is really happening. Look at verse 3 and 4 of 1 Corinthians 14. It says this. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh what? Mysteries. Paul is now placing attention for the rest of the chapter between doing something in the church that people can understand and doing something in the church that people cannot understand. And the tension goes through the rest of the chapter. All right? Look at this. It says here. What it says? But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation. And what else? And comfort. Read. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies who? Himself. Himself. But he that prophesieth edifies the church when the word prophesying means to preach to teach those who do that edify the church but he says if you are speaking a tongue that nobody knows you are only edifying yourself and that sets up something for you because in verse 6 through 11 paul uses the trumpet and the horn to show that if, if sounds are made that people do not understand, it just creates confusion. And this is where I'm heading today, and this is important. Listen to me. It is important to notice that when you read 1 Corinthians 14 in the Greek language, the word unknown does not appear. It's not there. In the Greek, there's no discussion of an unknown tongue. Because the Greek word for tongues, glossa, means language. <laughs> Let me repeat that again. The Greek word for tongues is glossa, meaning language. If it is a language, somebody has to know, somebody has to know it, or then it's not a language. Everybody got that? Yeah. So 1 Corinthians 14 is not discussing an unknown tongue. 
It is discussing the misuse of known tongues. Are you following me? And every time the word unknown is actually shows up in, 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 um, in 1 Corinthians 14, you see it in verse um, 2, 4, 13, 14, 19, and 27. Yeah, let me repeat that again. I'm sorry. 2, 4, 13, 14, 19, and 27. If not, go back, rewind the tape, and it's there. There is no word unknown in the Greek. So what Paul is really dealing with is the misuse of tongues that people can understand. Everybody got that? Paul is dealing with what? The misuse of tongues that people can understand. Say it again. The misuse of tongues that people what? You see, what Paul is really saying is this. If I stand here and start speaking to you in my native language, Spanish, and there is not another person who can interpret me, though God loves me, I need to be quiet. Because you cannot understand me. You see, if they invite me to Africa to preach, which they already have, but I do not have an interpreter there, then my trip to Africa will be just sounds, noise. The people will say, man, Pastor Mario seems so excited about something, but we have no idea what it is. That's what Paul is talking about. He's saying, if you have a tongue and you're speaking it, but there is no one there to back him, uh, you know, to back him up. Then we want him or her to sit down and be quiet. We're not getting it. Isn't this practical? You see, this is very basic. The chapter is not really hard to understand. Look at verse 22 of, of 1 Corinthians 14. The next point is amazing. Read, it says, Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe. Stop! The gift of tongues is not for the purpose of believers. You got that? Yeah. Keep reading. But to them that believe not. But prophesying, meaning preaching, serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. If you go to Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit is actually outpoured, and the disciples were suddenly given the signs of, you know, the gift of tongues, the people say, hey, we can hear them speaking in our own language. The, the sign was so convincing, non-believers, you know, they were like, wow. Right? Friends, these texts are so clear. Now, I want to take you now through several verses in chapter 14. Starting in verse 13. You ready? This is what it says. Read. Wherefore, let him that speak in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Did you follow that? Simply put, he or she should be bilingual. If you want to speak Spanish, go ahead. But when you get done with it, speak some English. Everybody got that concept? That's what Paul is saying here. If you're going to speak in your native tongue amongst people who do not know your native tongue, pray that when you get done, you can explain it or you can explain what you said. That is so practical, I don't know what else to say. It's so practical that I'm always asking myself, how could people miss this? Verse 14, this is what it says. It says, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Let's say that I decided to pray in German. And I just learned some German words. But I don't have the slightest idea what I'm saying. I'm praying my heart out with words I don't understand. 
Paul says, my spirit has not benefited, benefited from that. You see, Paul is talking about a, a, a kind of worship that benefits everybody present in the worship service. Somebody have to say amen. Look at verse 19. It says, yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that my, my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Everybody got that? Yeah. Then in verse 27, it says this. Is it making sense? Is it making sense, everybody? Praise the Lord. Look at verse 27. It says, if any man speaks in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most three, and that by course, and let one interpret. By course means one after the other. It has to be a language. You know, verse 28 is literally the decisive verse. Right? Here we go. This is what it says. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. And folks, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I have friends, very sincere Christians, who do not understand this. We will not make any light of them. People who were convinced when they came to Christ that they must have this experience to be saved, some of you may have come from that kind of background. Folks, we should be very prayerfully concerned that Satan has been successful at causing some people to struggle for an experience that they have never really had. Some have pretended. Feeling that if they don't act the way that other people act, they will be what? Condemned. My grandmother went through this whole thing. She told us how she, she you know, they, they brought her into the bench in the front of the church and everybody around her was actually, you know, using, you know, other tongues. And she told us that she went into something to get them off her back. This is serious business. So let's summarize what we have learned. All right? Let's summarize. Number one, there are nine spiritual gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12. So how many? Nine. How many? Nine. Number two, none is more important than the other, nor is one more a sign of being saved than the other. Number three, if there is something that is important, it is love, which all true believers must have. Folks, you got to love people. All right? Number four, the gift of tongues is not proof for proof of believing for believers. Number five, in a worship service, it is important that what is said be understood. If not, it should be left for private worship. You don't want me to come here on the Sabbath and then start speaking my native language Spanish. You will be tipping, you're like, I'm getting out of here. I don't understand why he's saying. Number six, God should not be connected with confusion or disorder. Never. Now, the worship of Christians in Corinth, before they became Christians, was sensational. Of all the gifts of, by the Spirit, uh, the ability to express oneself in another tongue was sensational, was dynamic. It was very appealing. Uh, and, 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 and became a source of pride and, and identity amongst the early Corinthian believers, men and women. It became a source of 
comparison or spiritual endowment among, among believers. God never intended that, the, that gifts from the third person of the Godhead be a divider. He wanted it to be a uniter. He wanted the gifts to unite the church. Unite the church into one body, just like the human body is held together by the function of all its parts, whether the part be a major part or a minor part. So a major issue in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14 is the unity of the church, but even more of an issue was the issue of syncretism. The Corinthians had not let loose of past things, thrills, attitudes, attitudes they experienced in their pre-believing days. They were clinging to and trying to transfer things they did before into Christianity. Can that be happening to you? Could something you believed before, some syncretism, be crippling your relationship with Jesus Christ today? Are you a syncretist? Have you kept things with you since you came into the church? Do you have a little syncretism in your collection of videos at home? What about your relationships? While you form relationships with people in the church, are there still people that you spend time with that you know that if you spend enough time with them, they're going to take you into something that you used to have? Or something you used to do. You see, friends, syncretism is not just about tongues, but it is about holding on to things that are not of God. And I need to preach about this because I'm tired of people asking me about this specific gift. Let me tell you, syncretism is diluting the church. We are trying to be like everybody else. Churches that look more like a concert than a church. Is your use of money syncretistic? Yeah, yeah, you, you, you tithe... You do tithes and offerings, but you're still purchasing things that have no business coming into your house. Are you syncretistic in how you treat people? You're nice, putting a front on Sabbath, kind to people on Sabbath, but you are the devil in your house? And then you excuse yourself by blaming others for the way you act? Are you a syncretistic dresser? You come to church dressed a certain way, but if I come to your workplace, I would not even recognize you? Are you a syncretistic eater? Eating some things that are healthy, but not turning loose to those things that are not? Why is it so quiet here? Or are you a doctrinal belief syncretist? You see, the Corinthians were not just mixing health and life with the Christian lifestyle. They were mixing heathen beliefs with Christian beliefs. Some of us sitting here today keep the Sabbath day like many people keep the first day of the week. We think that Sabbath is just for going to church. Then we go home. Our TV goes on, and I'm not talking about religious telecasts. No, no, no. There are many Seventh-day Adventist Christians that know the Sabbath college football scores before the sun sets. Syncretistic Sabbath keepers. Some of us are still syncretistic. Some of us have not learned. Let me, let me stick this one in. Thank you, Jesus. 
some of us have not learned or do not want to accept that the Sabbath observance is from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday and everything in between is holy time. There are still Seventh-day Adventist Christians who are syncretistic on the state of the dead. I'm amazed that members of the church who after people that, you know, who go after people that are dead, speak of them of being in the face of Jesus. Members of the church have not read Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 5, for the dead know anything. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Let me be direct. Are you a real seven-day Adventist? Do you know what that is? The Corinthian church was full of good people. Sincere people. People who by their lifestyle and by their, by their choices have come a long way. I mean, think about it. They, 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 you know, when Paul found them, they were worshiping Aphrodite. It, it was a, a great step for them to move to, from that kind of lifestyle to being a Christian. We have to give them credit. They came a long way. We got to admire that. But all ways are hard to cut loose of. And the devil was able to take one, one thing, one aspect of their faith. That, and that's what bothers me, just that one aspect. They decided that speaking in tongues was more important than any other gift. And raised it to a level of significance and symbolism never intended by God. In other words, they took a religious thing and made it into an unrighteous act. And right now, I want you to search your life. Have you really cut loose of everything? Or have you taken some of the old ways and old habits and blessed them by permitting them to still exist in your life? And I don't want you to think shallowly. I want you to think deep. I want you to look at yourself carefully right now. And my call today is not to join the church. Today the call is for people who want to join Jesus. I mean, you already said yes, but you have not come all the way. That's what the call is today. You're still trying to mix truth with error in some part of your life. Diet, money, relationships, you decide. And I can tell you, you are the decision maker. Your choice of music, your choice of entertainment, you're, you're trying to mix truth with error and it's your decision. I'm just giving you the opportunity to deal with it just like I have to deal with it. What is it that you got to give to Jesus today? What is it that you're holding on to from coming all the way with him? Do you want to give it up today? Do you want to walk out of this sanctuary with your head held high? Because from today forward, there will be nothing between you and your Savior. It's time. It's time that your life be led by the Spirit. No more pretenses. No more excuses. Today you're saying, no more. And if that is you, let's meet each other down here. So we can have a special prayer to let go of those syncretisms in your life. Who wants that prayer? Who desires that prayer? Don't let it go. You want to leave it. It's the time right now. 
right now. You can hear a pin drop here. I can tell that the Holy Spirit is here. Anybody else that want to take those steps of faith? Say, Lord, no more. No more excuses, no more pretenses. This is it. Father in heaven, we're standing, we have approached your altar because we don't want to mix truth and error anymore. No more excuses. We want to live the way that you want us to live. We want to do what you want us to do. And Father, I know the devil is not happy. But right now I'm claiming the blood of Jesus for everyone that has actually stood up or came close. Jesus, we need you to cover us with your righteousness. We need you to give us strength because right now we're, we're, we're just keeping so many things from the past in our lives that, Lord, it has, been, it has become such a habit that we know it's going to be hard to let loose, but we can do it because we are, we are saying to the Spirit, Spirit, take it. We give you permission to take it. We don't want any more syncretisms in our lives. We just want to be one with Christ. We want to be holy in Christ. We want to be united in Christ. So Father, right now I pray and I hope that your message was delivered for your honor and your glory and that it have reached someone that may have this misconception about the gift of tongues. Father, bless them because everyone with the sound of my voice here and at home are making decisions right now. So Father, whatever it is, whatever it is, Lord, take it. Take it, Father. And we ask in all of this, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated.